Critics of the traditional Latin mass often raise the objection that the priest is far away from the people, set apart as the only one offering the liturgy, that he does everything and they do nothing, that he, that he ignores them and they are lost, etc. These are the sort of claims that drove the original liturgical reforms of the 1960s, although it should be noted that it was never the faithful who asked for the reforms, but rather the experts, so-called, who claimed to know best what people needed. Experience has taught me and study has shown me that the objections are rather superficial and that if we think about things more carefully, we will find, on the contrary, that the traditional approach makes much more sense of the paradoxes of divine worship. The hieratic distance between priests and people serves to accentuate the divine presence that invites all of us deeper into the liturgy and impresses on us the seriousness of our common work of worship. The priest's more involved role serves as a model and an invitation for the faithful's prayer as they learn from watching and following like apprentices from a master. And the apparent ignoring of us people in the pews by the clergy busy in the sanctuary liberates us from a merely horizontal and human self-enclosed circle in which the higher acts of prayer are suffocated in low-level communication and comprehension. I'm going to take as my point of departure a juicy quote from the blog, Where Peter Is. Maybe some of you have heard of it. It's a site that promotes a limitless ultramontanism, exempt from the requirements of tradition, magisterial consistency, or reason itself. Some wags have dubbed it Where Pachamama Is, but let's not digress. In a title that would have served well for the Babylon Bee, the blog published an article called Pope Francis, Guardian of Tradition by a certain Terence Sweeney. Sweeney launches broadsides against the clericocentrism of the Tridentine Rite and the need for a new mass that would at last allow the people to have their proper role. He writes, quote, the Tridentine liturgy centered on a cleric in a parish all liturgical ministries are conducted by the one celebrant, along with other clerics or altar servers dressed in clerical garb. The laity had little role, hearing little and saying less. A liturgy in which the laity has no active role cannot express the ecclesial reality that the members of the laity do have active roles in virtue of baptism and confirmation. The liturgy of the Second Vatican Council is better because it is suited to this era of the church. More importantly, it activates the full body of Christ. In fully involving the laity in the roles proper to them, Vatican II activated the whole church. To separate the active apostolate from the active liturgical practice is to foster an ecclesial incoherence. The Roman rite, and by that he means the Novus Ordo or the modern rite of Paul VI, in contrast, fosters the full coherence of the church by summoning all to active engagement in the liturgy in ways impossible in the Tridentine Rite." Unquote. So that's Terence Sweeney's opinion. This way of arguing is so common as to be predictable on the part of those who have little experience and even less understanding of traditional worship. Only one who is profoundly ignorant of liturgical history and theology could forge a terminological contrast between the Tridentine Rite and the Roman Rite, when in reality the former was the only Roman Rite the Church had, not just for 400 years, but for at least 1400 years, if we take into account its full historical sweep from St. Gregory the Great to St. Pius V to the eve of Vatican II whereas the Novus Ordo bears little resemblance to any liturgy familiar to Catholics prior to the 1960s. <clears throat> but this all too common misunderstanding gives us a welcome occasion to dig deeper into this problem of lay involvement so as to arrive at a greater appreciation for the wisdom of tradition. 
One of Jacques Maritain's most famous books bore the title, The Degrees of Knowledge. Its subtitle, however, is much more interesting. Distinguish in order to unite. The book reminds me of a statement in a, a modern theologian. The more you divide, the less do you really distinguish. As if to say, by distinguishing two things well, you show how they are in fact united to one another in a relationship. We see this most luminously in the mystery of the hypostatic union, where in Jesus Christ, the divine nature of the word and the human nature consisting of a rational soul informing an organic body are perfectly united. As in the classic formula of Chalcedon, distinct but not separated, joined but not confused. How wonderfully the Latin mass distinguishes between the identity of the priest offering the mass and the identity of the laity who assist between his role and theirs. By clearly and consistently delineating what is a priestly act and what is a congregational act, the classical liturgy more deeply binds together the celebrant and the people in a common act of worship that is nevertheless hierarchically differentiated. By emphasizing to the maximum the priestliness of the priest, it brings him into the closest spiritual union with the people on whose behalf he serves and for whom he mediates. This in turn forms the laity in such a way that they can be mediators vis-a-vis -vis the secular world, whose conversion and transformation is their special vocation. Christ is the mediator on behalf of man. The priest is a mediator on behalf of the faithful. The faithful are mediators on behalf of the unconverted world. The hierarchical action of the liturgy does not end with the clergy, but extends in this way to the people and through them to every nook and cranny of creation. But it does so in a hierarchical manner, that is, not higgledy-piggledy, democratically, but in strict accordance with distinctions established by God. This must be so, not only because God delights in order, diversity, rightly understood, dependency, obedience, service, and sacrificial love, but also because he himself is, in some mysterious sense, hierarchical in himself. He is order within absolute unity. The Father is the origin without origin. The Son is originated from the Father and, as one with him, originates the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is only originated. They are one, Yet the persons proceed in such a way that the monarchy of the Father is eternally established. Paradoxically, it is by seeing what is proper to the priest that the faithful come to understand what is proper to them as a priestly people. We are doing analogously what he is doing. We come to know this marvelous truth of our participation in the sacrifice of Christ only by seeing the mystery done outside of ourselves, beyond our reach, and at a level that, in fact, does not belong to us. Even as the salvific and sanctifying action of Christ the High Priest surpasses the capacity of any human being. This is the way we learn almost anything, by watching it done or hearing it explained by someone who knows how to do it well, and then entering into it from below, as it were. The difference, of course, is that with something like literacy, we can eventually become the equal or even the superior of our reading instructor because a natural skill grows with time and age. Whereas with priesthood, there is a qualitative difference in the sacramental character of baptism and the sacramental character of the ordained. The layman is equipped to offer himself, his actions and sufferings, his loved ones, and the world of his work to God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The priest is equipped to offer the very sacrifice of Jesus Christ on behalf of the same divine person. We see this emphasized again and again in the prayers themselves of the old Roman Missal. The separate confiteors of the celebrant and the servers, they are not interchangeable. Phrases in the offertory like, which I, thine unworthy servant, offer unto thee, my living and true God, for my countless sins, 
trespasses and omissions, and likewise for all here present, and that it may avail both me and them, and plenty of similar examples, which I will return to in a moment. That the Mass is a true and proper sacrifice is far more evident in the Vetus Ordo, the traditional Latin Mass, than in the Novus Ordo. In its prayers and gestures, the traditional Mass readily presents itself as the fulfillment of the Old Covenant in the institution of the New Covenant. I, I, the worshiper, can see that the priest is going up to the altar on my behalf to offer sacrifice to God for my sins in continuity with the old priesthood ministering in the temple with animal sacrifices and incense, now truly accomplished once for all in the self-offering of the divine victim. Prior to the consecration, the priest puts both hands over the bread and wine as the Old Testament priest would put his hands over the head of the sacrificial victim. This is a clear connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Sadly, in the Novus Ordo Mass, the language of calling down the spirit has been artificially grafted onto this gesture, completely changing the meaning into a fake Byzantine epiclesis, which the Roman Rite never had and never needed. At a sung or high mass, the salutary separation between priest and people becomes much clearer because of the phenomenon native to all traditional rites, Eastern and Western, uh, that we call parallel liturgy. Multiple things are happening simultaneously. In the Tridentine Mass, as in the Byzantine Divine Liturgy, the faithful or the scola may be singing a chant while the priest is saying or doing something else. The liturgy is a complex action with many participants who have different works to perform, yet coalescing around and culminating in a unity. Very different is the rationalistic construct of sequential liturgy favored by the architects of the Novus Ordo, where usually only one thing is allowed to be happening at a time, and everyone must wait until a particular task is done before moving on to the next one. This again seems to downplay the idea of multiple distinct roles that can overlap, like the lines of polyphony in a motet by Palestrina. The traditional rite makes manifest the nature of the ordained ministerial priesthood and the salutary separation between this and the common priesthood of all baptized believers. The Novus Ordo, with its permeable sanctuary, versus populum stance, lay lectors and extraordinary ministers and so forth, blurs the line between the two, blunting the many lessons and insights that the distinction offers. The beautiful ways in which the Old Mass distinguishes between the priest and the faithful with so, with so many signs at so many levels serves rather to unite the members of the mystical body in a common act of worship where the eye, the hand, the head, and the feet are content to be what they are and to do what belongs to them. One might say there is no body part dysphoria. In the traditional Latin Mass, I find great comfort in the fact that the priest is offering the Mass on my behalf to Almighty God. He was and is ordained to do so. That is his place, and it helps me to find my own. When a parent has to deal with a fussy baby and can't follow along, he or she can rest in the peace of the right, knowing that the father of the ecclesiastical family is taking care of it for me on my behalf and with the awesome power of Christ, the eternal high priest, carrying him and empowering him. I can, I can just revel in God's presence. I don't feel as if I have to actively participate in the Novus Ordo sense to feel like I've been to Mass. The action is so mighty and mysterious that my simply being there with faith and love is already a tremendous grace, a privilege, a participation deeper than external words or actions. I hear the Mass and I assist at it, but I am not carrying it myself, nor is it directed to me. It, it carries me to the Lord, to whatever extent His grace permits. The right carries me, I do not carry the right. The priest, too, though uniquely empowered to offer the holy oblation, is also carried by the rite, no less than the rest of us. 
Ultimately, we are all drawn by the cross into the glory of God the Father, from whom all fatherhood in heaven and on earth is named. Given what I've already discussed, we can see that a great benefit accrues to the people precisely from the priest himself in the traditional mass carrying the burden of his unique role as altar Christus or another Christ, acting in persona Christi Capitis or in the person that is on behalf of and by the authority of Christ the head, the head of the church, with numerous ministerial tasks never shared out to the laity responsibilities specific to himself and to his fellow clergy in the sanctuary. A proper priestly domain is traced out, so to speak, by the number of prayers and gestures that only the priest performs. One of the most tragic aspects of the post-conciliar liturgical reform is that in the mad race to make liturgy more communal, egalitarian, and active, this priestly domain was reduced more and more like the Indian reservations in early America that kept getting smaller and smaller as settlers moved in and took over the ancestral lands. The role of the priest was reconceived in a functionalist or utilitarian manner. His new work was to engage the people as their dialogue partner, to animate them, to occupy them with pious thoughts in a best case scenario. And even when he addressed God in prayers, he must do so out loud and versus populum towards the people, which creates cognitive dissonance as to who is really being addressed and why. His ministry was evacuated of its own interior spiritual density and earnest focus on God, its mediation of divine gifts, and turned into an extravated presidency of a social gathering. Now, there are a lot of problems with this sudden and radical change in the basic conception of what liturgy is and what the priest's role within it should be. Here I want to focus on the spiritual side of things. What might have been self-evident truths once upon a time are no longer evident to many clergy, to their superiors, and to their flocks. One such truth is staggeringly obvious, yet its implications seem to be not only ignored, but suppressed. The priest, too, the priest, too, has a soul to sanctify and save. Stated baldly, this truth is obvious. One might as well say that water is wet or fire is hot. But one may genuinely wonder if it's taken as seriously as it ought to be. Especially since the Second Vatican Council, pastoral activism has threatened to turn the priest into a glorified social worker a man so much oriented to others that he ceases to be oriented to God. The versus populum stance at Mass, so far from being just a groundless bit of false antiquarianism, becomes emblematic of a way of life. The celebrant is not so much offering a sacrifice to God on behalf of the people and of himself as a member of the Church, but rather offering a service to the people with himself in the role of teacher or showman. This dynamic has been analyzed so many times that it hardly needs elaboration. Consider in sharp contrast how the order of mass in the traditional Roman rite makes the priest pray for himself in a deliberate and earnest way. Not for someone else, not for the people, not for a vague set of intentions, but specifically for himself. After the sign of the cross, the first words are, I will go in unto the altar of God. The whole of Psalm 42 is recited alternately with the ministers as a personal preparation. Here are the priest's own verses. Just listen to this. This is the priest's side of that exchange. Judge me, O God, and distinguish my cause from the nation that is not holy. Deliver me from the unjust and deceitful man. Send forth thy light and thy truth they have conducted me and brought me unto thy holy hill and into thy tabernacles. To thee, O God, my God, I will give praise upon the harp. Why art thou sad, O my soul, and why dost thou disquiet me? Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. I will go in to the altar of God. Then comes the priest's own confitior, not a shared 
and therefore comfortably untargeted confession, but a personal one to which the rest of the church bears witness, and after which the lowly servers or subordinate clerics beg the Lord to forgive the priest specifically. He says, I confess to Almighty God, to Blessed Mary of a Virgin, to Blessed Michael the Archangel, to Blessed John the Baptist, to the holy apostles Peter and Paul, to all the saints and to you, brethren, that I have sinned exceedingly in thought, word, and deed. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I beseech the Blessed Mary ever Virgin, Blessed Michael the Archangel, Blessed John the Baptist, the holy apostles Peter and Paul, all the saints, and you, brethren, to pray to the Lord our God for me. As the priest mounts the altar steps, he prays in the plural, but surely with himself most of all in mind. He says, take away from us our iniquities, we beseech thee, O Lord, that being made pure in heart, we may be worthy to enter into the Holy of Holies through Christ our Lord, amen. Then bowing to kiss the altar, he prays in the singular, we beseech thee, O Lord, by the merits of those of thy saints whose relics are here and of all the saints, that thou wouldst vouchsafe to pardon me all my sins. Amen. Before the gospel, the priest recites these prayers at the center of the altar. Cleanse my heart and my lips, O almighty God, who didst cleanse with a burning coal the lips of the prophet Isaiah, and vouchsafe in thy loving kindness so to purify me that I may be enabled worthily to announce thy holy gospel through Christ our Lord, amen. Vouchsafe, O Lord, to bless me. The Lord be in my heart and on my lips that I may worthily and becomingly announce his gospel, amen. Perhaps the most striking example of a priest's prayer for himself is to be found in the traditional offertory of the mass, which emerged in the early middle ages and is to be found with similar texts in all Western liturgical rites. He says, receive, O Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, this spotless host, which I, thine unworthy servant, offer unto thee, my living and true God, for my countless sins, trespasses, and omissions. Likewise, for all here present and for all faithful Christians, whether living or dead, that it may avail both me and them to salvation unto life everlasting. Amen. So you see what I mean about the priest praying for himself. It's, it, the whole mass has these sorts of prayers. The lavabo, the washing of hands, is found in its full form. He says, I will wash my hands among the innocent and will compass thine altar, O Lord, that I may hear the voice of praise and tell of all thy wondrous works. I have loved, O Lord, the beauty of thy house and the place where thy glory dwelleth. Take not away my soul, O God, with the wicked, nor my life with men of blood, in whose hands are iniquities. Their right hand is filled with gifts. But as for me, I have walked in my innocence. Redeem me and have mercy on me. My foot hath stood in the right way. In the churches I will bless thee, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, etc. Of course, many other prayers in the order of Mass would include the celebrant, but I am keeping my gaze on those that tie in more personally with the priest's own role, his sinfulness and sanctification. The next obvious candidate, then, would be the nobis quoque peccatoribus of the Roman canon, when he strikes his breast and gently lifts his voice in humble confession. To us sinners also, thy servants, who put our trust in the multitude of thy mercies. So the, the, our, the, the servants in the plural there is the ministers in the sanctuary. Vouchsafe to grant some part and fellowship with thy holy apostles and martyrs, with John, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicitas, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and with all thy saints. Into their company do thou, we beseech thee, admit us, not weighing our merits, but freely pardoning our offenses through Christ our Lord. <clears throat> then in the embolism after the Lord's Prayer, he says, Deliver us, we beseech thee, O Lord, from all evils, past, present, and to come, and by the intercession of the blessed and glorious Mary, ever a virgin, mother of God, and of thy holy apostles Peter and Paul, of Andrew and of all thy saints, gracious, graciously grant peace in our days, that through the help of thy bountiful mercy we may be always free from sin and secure from all disturbance. Then he prays a little bit 
after that, three prayers of preparation, all of which must be said. O Lord Jesus Christ, who didst say to thine apostles, peace I leave you, peace, my peace I give you, look not upon my sins, but upon the faith of thy church, and vouchsafe to grant her peace and unity according to thy will, who livest and reignest God, world without end. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, who according to the will of the Father, through the cooperation of the Holy Ghost, hast by thy death given life to the world, deliver me by this thy most sacred body and blood from all my iniquities and from every evil. Make me always cleave to thy commandments and never suffer me to be separated from thee, who with the same God, the Father and the Holy Ghost, livest and reignest God, world without end. Amen. Let not the partaking of thy body, O Lord Jesus Christ, which I, all unworthy, presume to receive, turn to my judgment and condemnation, but through thy loving kindness may it be to me a safeguard and remedy for soul and body, who with God the Father in the unity of the Holy Ghost livest and reignest God, world without end. Amen. So all of these prayers in which the priest is praying for himself. At the moment of communion, the priest prays privately, still facing east, head bowed to the Lord, and crucially, in the midst of a communion rite of his own that completes the offering of the sacrifice, before he turns to hold aloft the Lamb of God for the congregation. I will take the bread of heaven and will call upon the name of the Lord. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. And he says that three times, of course. May the body of our Lord Jesus Christ keep my soul unto life everlasting. Amen. What shall I render to the Lord for all the things that he hath rendered unto me? I will take the chalice of salvation and will call upon the name of the Lord. With high praises will I call upon the Lord and I shall be saved from all mine enemies. May the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ keep my soul unto life everlasting. Amen. Having distributed the body of Christ, he recites two prayers after communion. Into a pure heart, O Lord, may we receive the heavenly food which has passed our lips. Bestowed upon us in time, may it be the healing of our souls for eternity. May thy body, O Lord, which I have received and thy blood which I have drunk, cleave to my inmost parts. And do thou grant that no stain of sin remain in me, whom pure and holy mysteries have refreshed, who livest and reignest world without end. Amen. And then finally, I know I'm reading you a lot of prayers, but this is part of my argument. Right? Of greatest importance in grasping the theology and spirituality of the Roman Mass is the last prayer said by the priest prior to his giving the final blessing. He says, May the lowly homage of my service be pleasing to thee, O most holy Trinity, and do thou grant that the sacrifice which I, all unworthy, have offered up in the sight of thy majesty may be acceptable to thee, and because of thy loving kindness may avail to make atonement to thee for myself and for all those for whom I have offered it up. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Mass does not suddenly end, but then merges into the last gospel, a gentle moment of meditation, gratitude, and farewell. When the beloved disciple proclaims the word made flesh, full of grace and truth, whom we have just offered and received. Now, I think we can all agree that the prayers I have just shared with you are extremely rich in their theological and devotional content, and in the intensity of their focus on the reality of God, with whom, above all, the priest is dealing at Mass. God is more real than a million members of the congregation, more real than a million priests, more real than the liturgy itself. He is an infinite living fire that consumes with love those who love him, burns away the iniquities of those who repent, and punishes the wicked with flames of justice. To this God of eternal splendor and righteousness, the mass brings the priest face to face, breath to breath, heart to heart. The prayers given to the priest to say must somehow be suitable to the truth of this encounter at the burning bush, at the top of Mount Moriah, at the edge of the celestial Jerusalem. They must plunge him into it and make him recognize the gravity and grace of what he is doing. Not even a thousand prayers could ever be sufficient compared to the one word uttered from all eternity in heaven. 
but at least the liturgical rite must show a truthful apprehension of what is taking place in and through the priest, in his hands, by his voice. The rite will make him pray earnestly for himself and on behalf of the people for purification, worthiness, and divine help. It will be theocentric, fixed, even fixated on God, and will take the time and the silence and the gestures needed to approach the mysteries thoughtfully and to handle them reverently. That is what we see in abundance in any traditional liturgical rite, including the Latin Mass that we all appreciate for its obvious orientation to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and through him to God the Father of all, the Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Is it not then a monumental scandal, a frightening departure from wisdom, that nearly all of the priestly prayers I just quoted before were simply struck from Paul VI's Novus Ordo, which is denuded and exiguous by comparison, and which, practically speaking, is almost totally extroverted and procedural in nature? Not only that, but the modern rite took away most of the kisses given to the altar, many genuflections, many signs of the cross, a multitude of gestures that tied the priest to the altar, the sacrifice and the person of Jesus Christ whose high priestly character he bears. The modern rite barely addresses the subjective disposition of the one offering and the need for careful preparation. It hardly touches on his unworthiness and need for purification and mercy. It includes remarkably few signs by which an observer, unfamiliar with the Catholic faith, could detect that something wondrous, astonishing, and awesome is taking place, before which angels veil their faces and men beat their breasts. What were the liturgical reformers thinking? For them, the prayers of the priest for himself must have looked like exaggerated medieval piety and devotionalism, too introspective and clericocentric, as they like to say. The liturgy is for the people, after all. But this is manifestly a false view, both of what liturgy is and of what these specific prayers are meant to accomplish. The liturgy is above all God's work on behalf of the people, with the priest at their head. And as a consequence, he must be especially solicitous for himself that he may offer the oblation in holiness, in atonement for his own sins and for the sins of the people, and for the strengthening of the inward man, the new Adam in everyone. To remove or downplay this dimension is to gut the liturgy of that quest for righteousness that makes it serve the foremost need of every Christian, regardless of his place or role in the mystical body of Christ. Looking over the order of mass, we cannot help noticing that the Novus Ordo has largely purged this element of the priest praying for himself. While we can readily admit that moral and doctrinal problems existed among clergy before the council, we're dealing with fallen humanity after all, we have nevertheless seen an exponential rise, a tidal wave of clerical dereliction and corruption since the Second Vatican Council, and particularly since the introduction of the modern rite of Paul VI. If we actually believe in the power of prayer, can we not attribute much of our current crisis to the fact that priests, with the exception of the 1% or so that are celebrating the traditional liturgy, are not habitually praying for themselves and making confession and reparation for their sins in the context of the church's highest and most powerful prayer, that very sacrifice of the high priest to whom their ordination configured them and for the offering of which they have been separated and empowered. Such priestly prayers are meant to guide and inspire the priest to offer the liturgy in spirit and in truth, imbuing him with the gravity and grandeur of what he is daring to do. When God said to St. Catherine of Siena, I am he who is, you are she who is not, he is stating a basic truth of the spiritual life, one that must be forgotten neither in one's private rooms nor in the church's public worship. In his book, Cor Jesu Sacratissimum, Roger Buck quotes a priest who sent him the following description, quote, 
Unlike the Mass of Vatican II, in which a dialogue between celebrant and congregation carries most of the ritual, the prayers and rituals of the Tridentine form demand that the celebrant be continually attentive to the rites he is enacting. His voice varies from being audible to a quiet whisper. His eyes regularly turn to the crucifix. The movements of his hands are conscious and deliberate. Even when he turns to the congregation, the greetings are brief, his glance downward, his gestures precise. The priest is servant of the ritual, and the rubrics foster a mindfulness and self-awareness, which not only focus his own attention, but also that of the faithful, as they kneel once more at the foot of the cross. Each time before he turns to the congregation, the priest kisses the altar. Priest, altar, and sacrifice are at the core of Catholic worship. When he is at the altar offering the sacrifice, a priest's ministry finds its most sublime expression. His kiss of the altar is not only a sign of honor and respect for the source of his identity, but also an expression of his own affective attachment to his vocation." Unquote. It is no form of clericalism, but simply Catholic truth, to say that the priest is indeed given to the people as a model and a guide. All Christians in their baptism, and priests in a new way in their ordination, are ontologically configured to the priestly office of Christ. The priest, above all, should be setting the example of pursuing the holiness of a priestly people, that we, in turn, might catch fire from that example. The liturgy ought to be the image of the Christian life, not a mere filling station where the tank is filled up, as a popular Catholic online personality actually had the cluelessness to say. He said the Mass was a filling station where we filled up our tank, or a meeting place where we exchange greetings and announcements. Thus, as I discussed earlier, the priest's offering the sacrifice devoutly and earnestly for himself models to the entire congregation how they too must offer the sacrifice of themselves with Christ upon the altar. What he does and says in the liturgy is exemplary for all of us. Lay Catholics who follow along in their daily missals learn how to apply these priestly prayers analogously to themselves too. Everything the priest prays can be in a way prayed by us as well. In short, as prays the priest, so pray the people. It's as simple as that. If the liturgy is reduced to a priest's engagement with the people, the people's liturgy will be reduced to their engagement with the priest. If the liturgy is oriented to God, with the priest offering intense pleas for his own forgiveness and purification and earnest appeals for sanctification and salvation, the people too will ask for the same often with the same words and even with the same or similar bodily attitudes. They will be habituated to seeing liturgy as the locus of God's work of salvation among us. I am reminded here of a saying recounted by Dom Jean-Baptiste Chotard. He was a Cistercian monk earlier in the 20th century. He said, if the priest is a saint, the people will be fervent. If the priest is fervent, the people will be pious. If the priest is pious, the people will at least be decent. But if the priest is only decent, the people will be godless." Interesting quotation. Actually, I first heard this saying in another form that is perhaps more striking, although a bit melodramatic. If the priest is an angel, the people will be saints. If the priest is a saint, the people will be good. If the priest is good, the people will be mediocre, and if the priest is mediocre, the people will be beasts. Some people, like where Peter is, that, that website I mentioned, some people might roll their eyes at the supposed clericalism of this sentiment, but to me, and I imagine to many others, it expresses a fact about our communal life as Christians that we would be hard-pressed to deny or refute. There will never be an Orthodox Christianity in which the priest does not have the primary role in the liturgy as the mediator and the model of our approach to God. This cannot but have ripple effects in every aspect of the Christian life. 
Are we really surprised that holiness flourished in the parish run by St. John Vianney or near the confessional of Padre Pio? Such examples could be multiplied endlessly. As prays the priest, so pray the people. And a priest who lives from and for the altar, the sacrifice, the bread of life, will raise up a people who live from and for the altar, the sacrifice, and the bread of life. Over and over again, experience has impressed upon me the importance not only of what the priest says, but of what he does and how he does it. The ceremonial aspect, the clothing of the words, if I could put it that way. The way the priest is dressed, the way he behaves, the way the acolytes fulfill their tasks, the nature of the sacred vessels, the design of the altar, the gestures and motions, all of these are like the clothing of the mysteries, which are too bright for us to see without mediation, without help. We can compare it to the clothing of Mary, the mother of God. Would Our Lady wear immodest or ugly clothing unworthy of her dignity? Of course she would not. And neither should we in our public worship of God. All of our rights should be fully and magnificently clothed in the vesture of royalty. This is how, for example, we should see the use of the noble Latin language, specially set apart after untold centuries of use in the sacred liturgy, consecrated to divine service. When we hear the sonorous, lofty, unchanging sound of Latin, we know instantly that we are at worship. The church's public homage has commenced. It is offered not for the instant and simple grasp of the people, as a didactic lesson would be, but for God, first and foremost, as a sweet offering of incense, the fragrance of ancient orthodoxy and timeless praise, uniting us with the saints of our history and the saints in heaven. The worship rises above the bounds of this present moment in society and culture. Latin, together with Gregorian chant and periods of silence, serves as a sonic iconostasis, a symbolic barrier that, on the one hand, tells us we are on sacred ground and should not succumb to the temptation of excessive, over-easy familiarity with God. And, on the other hand, reminds us forcibly that we are now being invited into the embrace of his divinity, summoned to a foretaste of beauty and happiness that exceeds all our earthly concepts and projects. The very differentness of traditional worship is its chief strength, helping us to overcome the domestication and the secularization of God that is a perennial human temptation, whether in the form of rank idolatry or in the more subtle forms we see in the modern West, like the pursuit of a humanistic interreligious global fraternity that elbows out the gospel of Jesus Christ. Another example of how the traditional mass is clothed in the vesture of royalty, the royalty of Christ, is the customs surrounding the most blessed sacrament, which is, after all, our Lord himself. The host and the chalice are treated with the uttermost reverence at every moment. An elaborate offertory and the unsurpassable Roman canon make, make it clear that the bread and wine are intended to become and do become the sacrificial victim, the Lamb of God, in the sacramental separation of his body and blood. The priest once again relates in a specifically priestly way to the people by being the only one who handles the body of the Lord and gives him to the faithful. When the faithful receive communion on the tongue, kneeling, the divine nature of the food we are receiving is emphatically proclaimed. We did not earn this food. We could not obtain for ourselves as we do when we bring home the bacon. And we cannot even feed it to ourselves. We have to be fed by another. Only Christ our Lord can feed us with himself. And thus his minister, who is empowered by the sacrament of holy orders to stand in his place and to do his work, feeds us who, like little children, humbly allow ourselves to be nourished. The heavenly gift comes from above, down to our mouths. We obey God, who tells us in Scripture, open wide your mouth and I will fill it. All the ceremonies surrounding the body and blood, be it the many genuflections, the priest holding together his thumb and forefinger, the thorough ablutions of the fingers and vessels, 
Everything conspires to show us, to reinforce our faith, that we are in the presence of God himself, whom we must never treat in a casual, sloppy, ordinary way, for that would be no better than contempt. Surrounded by angels, we do not think it too much to imitate, however poorly, their perfect service, which tirelessly attends to every detail. Two truths are impressed upon us when we hear the priest speaking or singing Latin. First, we learn that the realm of the divine, though it penetrates into our world and surrounds it, is also a realm of its own, above and beyond our world. A thousand years ago, when more people spoke and understood Latin, its linguistic beauty and nobility would still have been appreciated, but it would not have seemed so foreign. And to that extent, I maintain that we are more fortunate than they were, because Latin is now so stamped and impregnated with sacred significance that it functions nearly as a sacramental, like holy water that blesses those who use it and those upon whom it falls. At the same time, as rational animals, we should be moved by a desire to grasp some of the meaning of the Latin, not only its generic symbolic value, but the intelligible content the liturgy is offering us. That is where education comes in. We should pay attention, at least sometimes, to the prayers of the liturgy, starting with the translations in a daily missal. And as time and opportunity allow, we should learn some ecclesiastical Latin. The special character of the language is not in the least diminished when we start to grasp its meaning. On the contrary, we come to appreciate its incomparable vividness, its poetic beauty, and the subtlety with which it conveys the truths of our faith. It is truly a perfect instrument for its purpose in worship, and as we grow in our awareness of it, we see and marvel at that perfection all the more and penetrate more deeply into the truths expressed in the language. Mystery and catechesis, liturgy and education do go together as natural companions. Even if it is true that the traditional Latin mass does a lot more silent catechizing than the Novus Ordo does, much of the liturgy will remain a closed book for us unless we take some time to deepen our understanding of its prayers, antiphons, readings, and ceremonies. Fortunately, it has never been easier to do this than today when we have access to excellent books and articles that can serve as guides on this road of discovery. Now, uh, just a little shameless advertisement here. Uh, I have this, this particular book called Reclaiming Our Roman Catholic Birthright. I wrote it to explain the Latin Mass to everybody, uh, <laughs> why it does what it does, how it ticks, um, why the objections against it fail. So you might want to check that out if you're interested in the sort of things I've been talking about tonight. I go into them all there too. Uh, it also contains, that book contains an annotated bibliography, which includes books for younger readers and recommended websites. So to conclude, the sorts of things I have been describing in my talk this evening, the hieratic distance between clergy and people in the old mass, the dense content of the priest's own prayers, which are often heard aloud by no one else, the use of Latin chant and silence as a sonic iconostasis, the manner of handling and distributing Holy Communion. All of these can be taken as illustrations of a general principle. Catechesis is more or less worthless if the signs of the liturgy contradict it. Catechesis is more or less worthless if the signs of the liturgy contradict it. To put it positively, the first and most elementary catechesis is how we act in the liturgy. How we act in turn shapes and is shaped by what we say we are doing in the liturgy. And I mean not what we say about the liturgy outside of it, but what is said within it and by it. Of Jesus Christ, we read in the first verse of the Acts of the Apostles, he began to do and to teach. The doing precedes the teaching. In its acta et dicta, the traditional form of the Mass more fully expresses and more intentionally inculcates the virtues at the heart of the Christian life than does its 1969 replacement. If we want to take Christianity seriously, if we really believe in the existence of truth, 
virtue, prayer, holiness, and eternal life. We will return as swiftly as we can to a liturgical rite that takes these things seriously and in its texts and rubrics imposes them on the celebrant as a sweet yoke and light burden uniting him with Christ. The traditional Latin Mass is the ideal form of liturgical prayer, not only for the laity, but also in a very special way for the priest. May more and more priests discover this truth and embrace it for their benefit, as well as for the benefit of the faithful living and dead. A holy and zealous priest plunged into the mysteries of Christ, united with the Savior's own prayer before the throne of grace, will always benefit the people of God far more than the people-centered or outward-oriented priest that the post-conciliar era sought and still seeks to produce. Let us pray for our priests who already love the traditional Latin Mass, who are now under a great deal of strain and suffering. Let us pray for priests who may be open to learning it. Let us pray for more and more vocations to the traditional priesthood and religious life. Wicked men who seek to extinguish the works of God may succeed for a short time, but their cancel cultus campaign will not ultimately prevail. We must have confidence in our Lord and, the, and in the intercession of his Holy Mother, who, when she says they have no more wine, will bring about new miracles of multiplication. May Our Lady Queen of the Clergy intercede for all priests and for all of us. Thank you for your kind attention. Could you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I hear you. So I, I'm a, I am at your uh, service now for questions, if any of you have questions to ask. Yes, Chris. What kind of evidence does the church have for the form of mass that's So you're talking about, so your question is, what evidence do we have about what the mass looked like in the early, earliest centuries? Is that what you're asking? As, when it came out of the catacombs? Yes. So one thing that's very important to remember is this. The early Christians worshipped in catacombs and in people's houses because they were under persecution, not because they wanted to have a living room mass, okay? Uh, and if they had to be simple and probably shorter than a Tridentine solemn mass, um, it's, it's because, uh, first of all, the liturgy, they, hadn't, they didn't have the peace and the time and the prayerful opportunity to elaborate and unfold and develop their liturgy into what it later became. Um, but when Christianity was legalized by the Emperor Constantine in the early fourth century by the Edict of Milan, I think that was 314, and suddenly Christianity went from being savagely persecuted to being favored by the, by the emperor. The first thing that happened was that the Christians came above ground, they went into the basilicas, they built gorgeous churches for themselves covered with glittering mosaics, and they offered solemn liturgies. And this was happening already in the fourth century. We have evidence of that. So really they were sort of just waiting to get into the basilicas and waiting to do something that was more you might say, more fitting to what they already believed. Right? So there's something very bizarre when, about liturgists who want to go back as early as possible and try to imitate what Christians were doing uh, when the Christians themselves in the early centuries didn't want to, <laughs> didn't want to leave the liturgy undeveloped and unexpanded. Um, and moreover, there's just the small problem, actually it's a huge problem, that our records are very incomplete from the early centuries, uh, and not only incomplete, but sometimes contradictory as well. So you can reconstruct almost anything that you have a fantasy for from, from some of the fragmentary records we have. So the church has never behaved that way. The, the, the way that the church has behaved is that each century, you might say, adds to the treasury, to the common store of public worship. You know, more, more hymns, more sequences, more antiphons, more chant, 
more ceremonial. Every century adds something, and the next century receives it gratefully and says, oh, that's great. Look at all this good stuff that we were just handed down. You know? uh, so the idea of, a, of an accumulation over time uh, that is seen as a positive development is just normal. That's the normal Catholic attitude. So the view that some liturgists had in the middle of the 20th century that basically the liturgy for a thousand years or more had become corrupted and needed to be radically simplified and abbreviated and purified is not a, a, a position a Catholic could possibly hold. That's a Protestant position. Right? The Protestants are the ones who say the church went off the rails really early on. You know? G Jesus sort of gave the church a push that lasted for 300 years or so, and then it just sputtered out right? and, until Martin Luther came along. You know? Um, and that's absurd. So I really, I really think that that's the way in which the liturgical reform is Protestant, most of all, that way. Not in particular details, but in that fundamental attitude of skepticism towards you know, over a thousand years of development in the liturgy. Yes. So, uh, <coughs> participation in the Novus Ordo sense, yes. the 1959 sense, whatever, and you came back at the end of your talk again on this concept of active participation, and uh, there are really three possible meanings of that. <coughs> uh, for the active participation of the faithful in the Novus Ordo could be to do exactly what the priest does, and this is the sort of leveling you talk mm -hmm. about. Uh, there's also the very vulgar conception of it as motion of the body, that you have to be mm -hmm. serving as lector, or bringing up the gifts, or shaking a tambourine. Mm -hmm. You know, this is active participation. Pope Benedict uh, argues <coughs> that active participation is the same in the Novus Ordo, as it was in the traditional Mass mm. for the faithful. That is, if we're to be joining our prayers and offering our sacrifices, the priest yes. offers the perfect sacrifice. Mm. We offer the frustrations of our week yeah. or you know, the illness of the or what, what have you. But again, he argued that the act of participation was always intended to be the same in the new mass mm -hmm. as it was in the old. Yes. Now I understand your position to be that the old mass and the new mass, uh, active participation is necessarily a different thing, mm -hmm. or that the participation of the faithful is necessarily distinct, that there's a change mm -hmm. in the role of the priest in the new mass. And so yes. it's unequivocally a rupture. But Benedict argued, of course, for a continuity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm wondering if I'm understanding your yeah. position. Yeah. No, I mean, thank you for that question. It's a good question. No, I, I have a more, I have a more, I, I would like to say that I have a more nuanced position than that in, in the sense that I see, um, I, I think one of, that, one of the most helpful ways to explain the participation of the laity is to compare it to the body-soul composition in man. So man, of course, is, is, is a composite of soul and body. The soul is incomparably more important. The soul is, that, is the principle that makes us alive, makes us human, makes us rational, uh, makes us able to be divinized. Uh, it's not as much as we have a body that that's the case. And it's finally that which survives death. So the soul is incomparably more important than the body. Nevertheless, man is a composite of body and soul, and that's why we have the resurrection of the body. You, if you don't get your body back, you're just, you're just sort of permanently crippled you know, as a, as a human being. So similarly, with active participation, it has two dimensions. It has the interior and the exterior, like the soul and the body. And my position is that the interior is incomparably more important and that the traditional liturgy has very specific ways in many ways to foster that interior participation and that the Novus Ordo systemically privileges or at least uh, very easily le lends itself to privileging the, the external participation and that it's actually more difficult to cultivate the interior participation through it. So I think it's more like a question of the ratios that are encouraged by, by each of those liturgies. And what I've noticed, like in my own experience, you know, I don't want you to think that 
that uh, you know, I've been attending the traditional Latin mass since I was uh, uh, what Shakespeare calls a puking, mewling babe. I mean, I, I discovered uh, the traditional mass in college, and for decades after that, I was, uh, I was providing music, I was directing music at both forms of the liturgy, uh, the modern one and the, and the traditional one. And so my experience, uh, what I found is that it was easier to pray at the Novus Ordo when we, for example, when we use Gregorian chant. And that's kind of a no-brainer, right? Because Gregorian chant is very prayerful music. It's contemplative music. Um, and for me, even when I sing Gregorian chant, it puts me in a, in a meditative frame of mind. Um, but as we all know, the Novus Ordo and Gregorian chant have not mixed very well together. They don't play nicely together, you know? At least that's been the way it, it's been in most places for a very long time. And unfortunately, Paul VI didn't think that Latin and chant had much of a place in the Novus Ordo. Um, he thought that the monasteries should keep those things, but he thought that the parishes had to go with the vernacular and with more modern, popular styles of music. I, I, I've studied extensively what Paul VI wrote, and I can, I can tell you that. Um, he says it specifically in two audiences, November 19th and November 26th, 1969. He says, we have to say goodbye to the incomparable riches of Gregorian chant and Latin. That's what he said. And why? Because we need to reach modern man. Well, I mean, it, it's not rocket science to see that modern man is still being reached by Gregorian chant. I mean, you know, when, whenever a chant album comes up, it goes to the top of the record charts, you know. People have a hunger for the sacred and a hunger for, for an encounter with, with the transcendent, is how I would put it. So that's, that's how I would say, I, I think that Cardinal Ratzinger slash Pope Benedict was trying his best to foster or create continuity as much as possible. But I think, unfortunately, for now, it seems like his project has failed, at least officially failed. That is, his project has been torpedoed, right? It's blown up, right? Um, but that doesn't mean that we ourselves can't see the value and the goodness of what he was aspiring to, right? Yeah. Back there. Yes. I left my crystal ball in the trunk of my car, but I'll do the best I can to, to your question. Uh, no, I, I think that's a very good point. Um, what's strange about modern Western persecution is that um, the, 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 so in most persecutions in history, the persecutors just went around chopping people's heads off, you know, and torturing them physically. And over time, they started to figure out that that actually backfires. And often, when you do that to people, you make them stronger. So the, the liberals, in general, I'm using that in a very general sense, have figured out that the best way to persecute people is to do it psychologically, not physically. Um, so not so much like the church. Well, in France, some of the churches are being burned down and, and statues are smashed. So I mean, there is physical violence happening. But I think it's, it's much more likely that whole career paths will be closed to Catholics. Uh, they won't be able to go into medicine or law or, there might be, I don't know what, I'm just saying that, that there will be more subtle forms of persecution that we'll have to be prepared for. Um, that being said, at least speaking about the modern Western world, and I, I try, I'm not saying this lightly because I'm, you know, I'm as weak as anyone else, but I think that the Western church could actually, would actually be strengthened by persecution. I think it's kind of overdue. Our church has become very lazy and, and um, 
uh, addicted to comforts and conveniences. Um, you know, we, we say, I think the COVID situation brought out a lot of this underlying malaise and this underlying sense of, do we really take our faith seriously? What, is, what do we believe? If we believe what we say we believe, we should never have acted the way that we did, um, in my opinion. And so um, I think that we could actually be uh, shaken up in a good way by the kind of thing that, that you were asking about. Let's not forget that there have been periods of history. The most famous one is, by far the most famous one, is the Japanese hidden Christians who lived for 300 years, I think it was 300 years, without any priests. There were, they were lay Catholics who kept the faith. They catechized their children. They kept baptizing them because baptism is the one sacrament that all of us can perform in necessity. Um, and they kept the Catholic Church going among lay people for three centuries until the missionaries came back. And when the missionaries came to these um, hidden Catholics, um, the hidden Catholics asked them, you know, a few questions, a few uh, pointed questions, and in order to recognize, you know, in order to, to discern whether they were really Catholic priests. And once they discerned that they were, then they had this reunion. So God sent them the priest. So the point being that, yes, the mass is the heart of our religion, but if the mass were taken away from us, we could still be saints. We could still live the Catholic faith. And in that situation, obviously we have the rosary and, and other forms of prayer, mental prayer. But I would also say, you know, if, if we can get used to praying the breviary or part of the divine office, you know, not the whole thing necessarily, that would be too much for most people, but to, to get used to the other liturgy of the church, one of the other great liturgies of the church is her divine office. And, you know, I, I'm a Benedictine oblate and I pray the divine office as much as I can, the monastic office, um, and it is so consoling to me, and it is so um, energizing spiritually that I can understand now why there were people who, you know, spent prison sentences just reading their breviary. I mean, it, it, it has a great uh, power to it and substance. So it's also a question, I think, of broadening our horizons about how to practice the faith. Right? That was probably more of an answer than you were looking for, but... Yes, yeah, so the question is, why, why if, if the vernacular was so important, why didn't uh, the liturgical reformers in the 1960s simply translate the Tridentine Missal into the vernacular? It's a great question. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the answer is that many of the liturgical reformers actually had serious problems with the Tridentine Missal and with the content of it. And they didn't want to reproduce that in the vernacular. They wanted to give people something else that they deemed to be more suited for modern people. Um, so for instance, uh, most of the prayers referring to fasting just went out the window because the liturgical reformers said, well, fasting is not being practiced very consistently anymore and you know, modern life is really hard and let's just get rid of fasting mentions of fasting. Whereas in the old missal, practically every day in Lent is talking about fasting. You know? um, sh you know, and should that make us uncomfortable? Yeah, I mean, I, I think when I attend the traditional mass, it makes me think I ought to be fasting. You know? Whether I am or not, it makes me think that, you know, that it's a bit lame for me not to be trying, aspiring to that. But if you just take out fasting, then what happens? It goes away from the Lex Arandi, it's just removed. And then it's suddenly like, well, fasting has almost no part in our faith anymore. Two days a year, Ash Wednesday, Good Friday, which actually makes it much harder to fast because the fa fasting, as the Byzantines know, the Byzantine Catholics who are serious about fasting, it gets easier if you do it for a while, right? If you only do it one day, once in a while, it's actually really difficult, right? So, um, yeah. so I, I guess the answer is, well, let's, let's just be blunt about it. Cardinal Ratzinger believed that it was possible to see a continuity between the old and the new missiles, and maybe that is defensible. I'm, I don't want to get into that at this point. But the people in charge at the Vatican right now, like Archbishop Arthur Roach, definitely thinks that the old and new missiles are not compatible with each other. He thinks that the theology has changed, the church's theology has changed with the Second Vatican Council. He has said that outright. And therefore, for a new theology, we need a new missile. And if you keep using the old missile, you'll get the, the defective old theology. That's how these people think. In, in, I, may, I, may have, I may be repeating myself right now, but I think that that's heretical. I think if you say that, you're not a Catholic anymore. 
Well, I mean, that's, if that, when that happens, it's shameful. I mean, there's no, there's no cleric in his right mind who should ever upbraid a Catholic for wishing voluntarily to, um, to show a customary act of piety. I mean, if you came into a church flagellating yourself or something like that, maybe they could, uh, you know, they could criticize you for that because it's ostentatious and draws attention to yourself. But if, if all you want to do is kneel to receive communion, which is what the church in the West was doing for about 1,200 years, um, and what Catholics are still doing in various places, uh, then that's totally unacceptable. And I mean, I would, I would write a letter of complaint if something like that happened to me. It may not do anything but, except make you feel better, uh, but, but it still seems to me a good thing to, to send a letter of complaint to the priest in question and to his bishop and say what happened and say how disappointed you are, something like that. Um, but I mean, the real solution to that kind of problem is just we all have to have street smarts about where we go to mass, you know, and I, I, I've reached a point in my life now where if I'm traveling, I will find a traditional Latin mass wherever I'm going. I will, I will make it so that my whole trip itinerary is built around that question, you know, because I don't want to be stuck in some big city and have to go to the nearest, you know, St. Bozo the Clown. I mean, I don't, you know, you don't know what you're going to get, so, which is, uh, which is, again, ironic because the moves against the Latin mass are being done in the name of unity. But if there's one area where there's no unity at all, it's the Novus Ordo. I mean, you never know what you're going to get. In, you know, in, in the same, sometimes even in the same parish, uh, the masses can be radically different from each other. So if we really cared about Catholic unity, we would be going back to the traditional missal. Yes. Yes. Can you address that, that just equalization of the Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the question is, um, what do you say to somebody who says, well, as long as Jesus is present in the Mass, then nothing else really makes a big difference, does it? Because, you know, how could you compare anything to God, you know? Um, it sounds like a good objection. It's a terrible objection because, first of all, it's precisely because our Lord is there that we need to treat him with the most respect and reverence and beauty that we can muster. And a failure on our part to do so, especially when we have 2,000 years of examples of how to do it, is a fault on our part. You know, if, if, if a king or a queen, and there still are some in the world, came to visit, you know, the, the red carpet would be rolled out and the, and the army would be brought in with their, their 21 gun salute and all this stuff. We, we would, in secular terms, we go bananas for just some mortal person, right? So what's our problem? Why, why can't we do that for our Lord? I think it's a lack of faith. I think people say that they don't realize what they're saying. If we really thought that our Lord was coming upon us, we would do everything we possibly could to welcome him certainly in the most reverent manner possible. It doesn't, it's not always possible to, to, to make a liturgy grand. You know, if you're a missionary in a remote place of Asia, then maybe the best you can do is a low mass in a hut. But at least the low mass is, is just permeated with signs of reverence and adoration, right? So it still welcomes the Lord as he deserves it, even if it's not grand, um, that, as it should be in a cathedral, for example. Um, the other thing is that we are the ones who need to be reminded of what we're doing. So the Mass is not a sacramental delivery system. It's not like a Pez dispenser where you go to it and the Eucharist comes out, right? I mean, that's a fair reductionistic, minimalistic, utilitarian way of thinking. The Mass itself is our, is a, an act of praise, thanksgiving, and, and glorification, honor of God. It's, it's, a, it's not just a place where we go to get the sacrament, it's also a place where we give God worship and honor. Um, so what we do at Mass and how we do it, it makes a great deal of difference. And not just what's the, what's the bottom line, what's the beginning, as it were. I mean, it's, it, it, think about it this way, it's a very reductionistic way of thinking. Right? It's a little bit like saying, we're all human beings, right? What does it matter how we dress? Right? And, well, actually, how you dress makes a big difference, you know, to how you think about yourself and how you think about what you're doing and 
um, and so forth. Okay, all this being said, first of all, we need to pray, right? Yes. Second, what do we as lay people do or can do? <laughs> I want to be an example. Because to me, I go to the ordinary, it seems like we have a Jesus over here. You go to the Trinity, you have a Jesus over there. Who is the real Jesus? Mm -hmm. All right, isn't he the same? Sure. So how do we educate our brother in to know, wow, God's here. Not well. Yes, yes, yes. That's where I'm torn. I even see the priest. You know, I think, old ways. right. I, I think that um, you know, there is no one size fits all solution. I mean, there are certainly, but I do think that there are Catholics. I, I mean, I, I know, I've known many Catholics, uh, and I'm sure you have. You've known Catholics as well, who, when they're invited to a high mass see that something very special is happening and that the servers and the priest are acting in a way that is much more obviously sacred and that the people are praying more intensely and more intensely um, and if somebody i think if somebody is serious about their faith they should be able to at some point respond to that and be attracted to that but there's also ideology and there's probably yeah, well, some people have been really, really sort of molded in a way that if they're not, it's almost like they find their personal value in lecturing or being an extraordinary minister or something like that. And if people who fall into that trap, are, they're, it's going to be a lot harder for them to make the transition. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, it's, it's, what do we do? I, we have to obviously be prayer for people ourselves. Um, and we have to be informed, and we need to sometimes be bold enough to bring people with us. You know, just like it, just like happened in the Gospels. You know, one apostle brought the next apostle to Jesus, um, and then you can see that even if Jesus is present everywhere the mass is offered, the manner of offering him is not the same, and that could have really profound consequences uh, for what we believe and for how. How serious can we take what we believe? That's that's in a way that's you know that's the main thrust of the talk. Yes, Father. Um, you have a prediction about what's going to happen uh, with the future of black mass, given that Pope Francis seems to be suppressing it. We think is it something that is in wrong? Yes, well, the, the first thing I will say about Pope Francis is that he, he follows his own advice to make a mess. Uh, and, and, so he, and so he himself has everybody guessing what's going on. And he just met with a couple of priests in the fraternity of St. Peter. And to the complete surprise of everybody else in the Vatican, he said, oh, I wasn't talking about you. I was talking about other, other people. You know, so suddenly now, um, it seems like there is another less sloppy. It, 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 he contradicts himself almost on a weekly basis, maybe even a daily basis. Uh, so it's not, you know, what exactly Pope Francis is up to is, is almost anyone's guess. But even if you give it the most negative interpretation possible, he's only going to be with us for a short time longer. And the change in, in papacy is going to be pretty dramatic. I don't actually expect, I hope I don't read these words, but I really don't expect Francis 2.0. I, I really don't expect that. I think the cardinals are fed up with the circus that's going on right now. And then, um, you know, and just think about what happened in 2005, right? In 2005, the St. John Mafia was trying to get Bergoglio elected pope, and Ratzinger came out of that conclave as better than the 16th. I mean, who would ever have to that? No, nobody, I mean, the whole world was in shock when that happened. Uh, at least those who were aware of who Ratzinger was and what he, what he stood for. So I guess what I would say is um, time is on the side of the traditional movement. There's going to be a rocky period where some masses are lost here and there. Um, but I don't think that priests and mother are going to stop saying it, at least privately. 
I don't think that lay people who love it are just going to roll over and play dead and say, oh, I, that was nice while it lasted, but I'm not going to do it. That's not going to happen. And there are millions of us now, um, especially if you count the SSPX as well. So I, I think tradition is not going anywhere. It's just, it's just taking a big batch away at the moment. All right, let me, let me conclude the Q&A there and, and head over to the table. So thank you again.